chapter 3 this morning as we continue our series uh, through the book of 1 John talking about perfected. So I am Brad, the teaching elder here at The Way. Uh, for those of you joining us online, uh, whoever that may be. And so again, I, I am excited to be here this morning. I want to golf pile on something that Joe said. So we're talking about sin this morning. And... Uh, and we're, we're going to talk in detail about sin. And if you think about it, so the only thing that you own, the only thing that I own currently is literally the breath that is in my lungs. Right this second. Uh, there's nothing else that, that I have been giving other than the very breath that I have, the current breath in our lungs. And when we talk about stewardship, I like that. What do you do with the breath that is in your lungs right this second? What is happening with the breath in your lungs? Are you using that breath that is currently in your lungs for what God would have you to use that for? And if you are not, and then we get into the issue of sin. Are we using it inappropriately? And so we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3 today as we talk about the gravity of sin. The gravity of sin. So I, I've said it before, and I'll, I'll repeat my claim that uh, we have in, the, in our church today, in the, in the Western church in particular, a very casual view of God. And we've talked about this before, that, that God is our friend, he's our buddy, uh, that, that Jesus is our homeboy. And my, my contention is that a casual view of God leads to a couple of different things. It leads to a casual view of that which God loves. What does God love? God loves, and God is love, and in some ways God loves everybody, but God has a special love for his people, for the church, so much so that he sent his son to die on the cross for the sins of those who would believe, his church. That's how much he loves his church. And so if we have a casual view of God, why would we not have a casual view of that which he loves? And thereby we would have no issue slandering the church or speaking poorly about the church or isolating ourselves from the church. We would have a low view of the church. At the same time, if we have a casual view of God, what we will see is we would have a casual view of that which God hates which is sin. And we don't like to talk much about that which God hates or the wrath of God or the hatred of God. You know, there is no K-Wrath radio. Maybe there ought to be a K. There's K-Love, but there's no K-Wrath radio for a reason. We don't like to talk about some of those things because they make us uncomfortable. And I hesitate a little bit to have a, a message dedicated specifically to sin. Some... You know, I worry sometimes. Do we talk of too much about sin? You know, can't we just talk about Jesus? Can we not just talk about love and Jesus and, and things that, 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 that make us feel good? Do we need to talk about sin so much? And there's times where I wonder, you know, do I quote unquote or do we, the church, push people away because we talk about sin too much? Well, a couple of things on that right up front. So here at The Way and Scott started this, and I, and I think it's great we preach exegetically through books of the Bible as much as we can. We go verse by verse. And, and that way we can remove as much of ourselves from the equation as we can. And hopefully it's all what God would say. And it just so happens that God talks a lot about sin. Matter of fact, this entire book, John says in, in chapter 2, verse 1, that I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. That's, that's one of the reasons he's writing this book. Well, let's talk about the idea of pushing somebody away, uh, you know, pushing somebody away from the church. Here's the, the deal on that. As I thought about that and I prayed about that, if God is calling you to the church, I could never push you away. If you are here because of God, then a person could never push you away from that to which God has called you. And then to those who say, well, can't we just talk about Jesus and love and good things? Well, the bottom line about that is that the glory of God and the grace of Jesus is meaningless apart from an understanding of the gravity of sin and the nature of sin and the seriousness of sin. The, the, the grace and the mercy of God mean nothing apart from an understanding of the justice of God and the wrath of God. And, and those things have to go together. So we have to talk about sin. And from today's text, as I was studying the text, it impressed upon me the gravity of sin, the seriousness of sin, the, the serious nature of sin. What, a, what an issue it is. So we're going to talk in 1 John chapter 3. 
We're going to rewind to chapter 2 a little bit and hit up the text that Scott read. We're going to focus on 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, talking about the gravity of sin. Where it says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who do, does not love his brother. And so John takes, as he does throughout this letter, a very strong stand. So we're going to talk right up front about sin a little bit, and then we're going to apply this text to us, to other people, and to non-believers. It's kind of the way I think that we should go. So let's talk about sin a little bit. There are some different words in the Bible that, that Scripture uses to talk about sin. I'll, I'll spare you my Hebrew trans or my Hebrew pronunciation this morning, but there's basically three words in Hebrew that address sin. Uh, one of those means outright rebellion. That means turning from what God has said. So I, God has said this, and I have decided I will do my own thing. Outright rebellion against authority is a Hebrew word for sin. There's another one that basically means wrongdoing. That's kind of the other side of the coin. You know, It's not so much rebellion. I'm not concerned about what I've been told to do, what the authority says. It's just I like to do this, and I don't care whether it's wrong or not. This is what I like to do. This is... This is the, uh, the, the lust that I, I like to pursue. And the other one literally means perversion. It means taking that which God has said. And God has said this is the way. This is the thing. This is how you ought to do something. And twisting that. And, and, and twisting that into something that is ungodly. And we see that actually fairly often today. Or very often today. As we take things that God has given to us. And we, we twist them up. And, and change them up into something that, that does not look anything like what was intended originally. Now we go back to 1 John chapter 3 right up front. He says that sin is lawlessness. There's 33 words in Greek that pertain to sin from 10 root words. The most common word is hamartia, which is often translated missing the mark. You know, I, I have a mark here and I, I'm shooting at it and I either fall short or I miss the mark in some way. I really like how John defines sin here. Sin is lawlessness, a, the absence of law, a lack of the presence of law, or a disregard for the law. God has said in his word, here is the way, walk in it. He says, this is the way, walk in it. Sin is refusing to do that for various different reasons. And we're going to talk about some of these reasons. So who was the first sinner? Eve, right? No, it was Adam. No, it was Satan was the first sinner. Let's talk about Satan. We should go back and unpack the motives of Satan because John talks about the devil. He talks about Satan. So if you go back into, into your word in, in Isaiah, and you don't have to flip there. I'm going to read these to you. There's a couple of different texts uh, that reference the fall of Satan. So between uh, the completion of creation on the seventh day, the fall of man, there was a, a war that happened in heaven. There was a war that happened. Now, it was transparent uh, to the man and woman on earth. It was transparent to creation. They didn't see any of this war happening. But the book of Revelation references this war that happens in heaven. And what happens is that Satan is the first rebel against God. Now, there's two prophecies in the Old Testament that are dual in nature. They're applied to earthly kings, the king of Babylon and the king of Tyre. But when you read them, it's obvious that the prophet is also speaking about Satan. And so I'm going to read you a little bit about the fall of Satan from Isaiah chapter 14. He says, How you are fallen from heaven, cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Listen to what Satan said in his heart. Listen to what Satan says in his heart. He says, 
I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then he says, Satan says, I will make myself like the most high. Satan says, I will be like God is what I will do. I will ascend to the throne, to the holy mountain. Listen to but Ezekiel, what he says, and this is a prophecy against the prince of Tyre, but when you read it, it's obvious that it's a dual prophecy in nature. He talks about Satan. He says, you are an anointed guardian cherub. I place you on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire that you walk, and you were blameless in your ways. Satan was blameless from the day he was created until unrighteousness was found in him. Unrighteousness was found in him. In him, And then listen to what he says about Satan. He says, you were filled with violence and you sinned. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And so I cast you to the ground by the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade. You profaned your sanctuaries. Satan was the most beautiful of all of God's spiritual creations. But because of his heart, because of his pride, because of his sin... God cast him out of heaven. And Jesus says in Luke chapter 10 that he fell like lightning to the ground. This is the first sin that was committed by Satan. And we're going to see that John references the sin of Satan here in 1 John chapter 3. And it's interesting as we see where sin first started was in the heart of Satan. I want to talk about two other accounts. So in the garden, when Satan comes to Eve, what was the first sin? Joe and I had an interesting discussion this week. You know, what was the first sin? Was it was it the doubt of Eve? You know that that, that God had, did God really say that that you know Satan induced her to doubt? Was the first sin the apathy of the man who stood by, uh, who stood there helpless as the woman was confronted by Satan? I mean, how should that have looked? It should have looked a lot like this. The man standing in front of the woman, placing himself between Satan and the woman and saying, get thee behind me, Satan, I rebuke you for telling lies. That's how that should have looked, but it didn't. And that'll preach an entire sermon right there. So what, what was the first sin? Was it actually hatred of God's word? God has said, he said to the man, here is my word. Here is how you ought to live. And in some ways, the man taught that to the woman because she knew what God's word word was. So what was the first sin? Was it hatred of God's word? Hatred of his law? And if you hate the law, do you not in fact show hatred for the law giver? Can you not hate? Can you hate the law without hating the law giver? I'm not sure that that is possible. Let's fast forward to another account. Book of Luke chapter 4. As we talk about sin, this is the account of Jesus in the wilderness, the temptation of Jesus. So at the initiation of his ministry, he's led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he fasts for 40 days. And so he's hungry. And I think that this is a, a display of the weakness of his humanity as he's, as he's hungry, uh, the text tells us. So you know, it's not... It's not as if he did not experience the hunger that we would experience. And so in the wilderness, he's, he's confronted by Satan. And Satan tempts him three different times. It's interesting that Satan, interesting to me, Satan didn't try to harm Jesus. He didn't try to kill Jesus. He attempted to incite Jesus to lawlessness. He tried to tempt Jesus to to sin. Obviously, that was an important thing to Satan to do. Why would Satan want to do that? Why would he not seek to harm Jesus physically in some way? I don't know. Maybe that was important to him. But you've read the story. Three times Satan goes to Jesus to tempt him, to confront him. He confronts him in the weakness of his flesh. And he says, you're hungry. Why don't you turn this bread to stone so that you can eat? It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, is how Jesus responds. He says, if you just bow down to me, you can. I will give you all of the nations of the world to worship you. Jesus responds, it is written, worship only God. And then he confronts him. He says, if you just throw yourself down from here, and he quotes scripture, that God will bear you up. He misquotes scripture, and Jesus responds, it is written, do not test the Lord your God. Each and every single time that Jesus 
is tempted by Satan to lawlessness, Jesus goes back to the law. He quotes Deuteronomy to Satan. That's interesting that he does that. And look at the things that Satan appealed to. He attempted to appeal to the pride of Jesus. He attempted to appeal to the base lust of Jesus. Again, as if this was possible, Jesus was not, he is without sin. It was not possible that he could sin. But this is what Satan was attempting to appeal to. His pride, his base lust, the fact that he might hate God enough to test God. And it reminds me of 1 John chapter 2 that, that Scott already read, talking about the world and the love of the world. And you cannot love the world and love God at the same time. If you love the world, the love of God is not in you. And what is of the world? The lust of the flesh, our base lust, the lust of the eyes. We covet that which we see in the pride in one's lifestyle. And those sound a lot like the temptations that Satan tried to place before Jesus. It's interesting if you see that account. Then we get to 1 John chapter 3. And John goes strong in this text. And that's what, that's what was impressed upon me. I mean, he, he doesn't give us room to sit in the middle. He doesn't give us room to sit on the fence yet again. I mean, what does he say in verse 10? He says, you are either a child of God or you are a child of the devil. I mean, you are one or the other. There's no in-between. There's no neutrality. John keeps destroying neutrality over and over and over again. He shatters this notion that we could somehow straddle uh, you know, the, the church in the world, that somehow we could straddle the fence or sit on the fence. He says you're one or the other. You are either a child of God or you are a child of the devil. And here's how you tell. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? think? What do you say? What do you do? What is your practice? What is the practice of your life? And that is indicative of who you serve. That is indicative of who your master truly is. We've got to get it out of the way right up front. We've got to make sure we say that we are justified by faith alone through grace alone. There's no works I could possibly do to merit God's favor. But what I do directly indicates who I am. Doesn't that make sense? That what you do indicates who you are? I mean, that makes sense to me, but that forces us perhaps into some uncomfortable truths. Let's talk a little bit about this text and what it means to us, what it might mean to other people, or perhaps to non-believers. So we've talked a little bit about the Christian walk, right? About being in the light. That, that the Christian walk ought to look like all, all of us, and this is where I talk about being in a formation and uh, some of us know what a formation is, but a square with our arms locked together. You're in the Air Force, so maybe you guys didn't do formations in the Air Force. But so picture a square of people with their arms intertwined. I picture them locked uh, at the elbows, uh, marching together in the light. That's how I picture the entire letter of first, or the entire letter of First John. Is, is I picture it in that way. And there is darkness. And there's darkness there. Uh, but when I see the darkness, it, you know, the Holy Spirit convicts me not to, not to walk in that darkness, not to go toward that darkness. Or my, my brother jerks me on the elbow and says, don't go that way. It's, it's, it's dark that way. I've been in that darkness. You don't want to walk in that darkness. I've been there. Don't go that way. And so the question here is for us that John gives us, do we walk as he's saying here? Do we practice walking in the light? Do we do the things that he tells us to do? What is the summation of your thoughts? The summation of your thoughts, the summation of your words, and the summation of your deeds. Do, do those indicate a person who is walking in the light? Do those indicate a person who is a child of God? Or do they not? Because again, John consistently confronts us to quit lying to ourselves. Quit telling ourselves lies if that is the case. He says, let's get honest with yourselves. Let's talk about our own sin just for a little bit. So James... In one, uh, James chapter 1, verse 15, uh, he talks about the progression of sin, whereby our desires, and we all have, uh, in some ways, we all have base desires inside of us. When those desires collude with temptation, they give birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. And that's where, that's where our sin comes from. That's the progression of our sin. But look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Those verses right there, the desires of the flesh. 
the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. Those are all internal things. I could do all of those things right now, and you would have no idea if I was doing those things. Those are internal things. I could walk around all day lusting after the flesh. I could walk around all day coveting and, and lusting with the eyes. I could walk around all day with the pride in my life, and you would have no idea. Those are internal things. And so the first thing we've got to talk about is our thoughts. Our thoughts. Somebody uh, used this as a, as a sermon illustration once, and I'll steal it. It, it. I think it's applicable. You know, what if somehow I had a machine that could take your thoughts and display them on the screen for everybody to see? And there was just a, a rolling uh, screen of our thoughts. So Memphis, is, if I had his thoughts up there, it would be like, are we going to Taco Bell? Are we going to Taco Bell? I hope we go to Taco Bell. How can I get us so we could go to Taco Bell? Boy, we haven't been to Taco Bell in like two weeks. And that's what I would see just over and over again. How can I talk to Adam and take us to Taco Bell? I hope Taco Bell is open. Boy, the power was out. So maybe they, gosh, I really hope Taco Bell. That's what you would see uh, if, if you were able to put Moose's thoughts on the screen. But it, it, seriously, what if, what if your thoughts were on display? I guarantee all of you would immediately leave this church if you could read my mind every single day. I guarantee it. Uh, that, that, and I'm just being open and transparent here as I can. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul calls us, though, to do the opposite. He calls us to take captive every single thought to the obedience of Christ. Sin starts in our minds and in our hearts and our thoughts. And so did you know that you have the discipline, you have everything you need to control what you think about? That that ability exists, that that discipline exists in your mind. And so God's word, his law tells us what are godly thoughts or not. And so when they come, it tells us to take captive every thought, not some thoughts, some of the time, but every thought all of the time to the obedience of Christ. We talk about the progression, the sanctification of the believer. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us to be transformed by what? By the renewing of our minds, by the disciplining of our thoughts, by thinking and dwelling upon godly and good and pure and lovely and holy things. You can fake it for a while. You can. I mean, you can fake anything for a little while. Think of our man Judas. You know, we talked about Judas a number of months ago. Uh, he faked it for three years. You know, for three years, Judas followed Jesus. He lived with Jesus. He served Jesus. Judas preached the gospel frequently. Judas was used by God, I'm sure, to save people. I'm sure that God saved people through the words of Judas. But Judas hated Jesus. He had hatred in his heart for God and for Jesus. And eventually his actions matched his, his thoughts, who he actually was. Again, you can fake it for a little while, but eventually it will spill out into either your words or your deeds. Let's talk about your words for just a minute. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul tells us that our words, every word, ought to be used to edify the body of Christ. Think about the things we say. Think about how you say the things that you say. And for men in particular, I, I, you know, I think that we struggle greatly with this one, uh, with the things that we say, and, and how we say the things that we say. You know, how do we communicate? How do we speak to people? How do we talk to particularly our wives and our daughters? And, 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 and how do we communicate? Do our words build people up or do they tear people down? Because if you think about it, sometimes your words are the first indication of what spills out of your heart comes in your words. Listen to what Jesus says. I don't want to mess this up. I want to quote what Jesus says. Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. How many careless words do we utter that we will give an account in some way for our careless words? For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. We are justified by faith alone, through grace alone, but our words, the way we speak, indicates whether we have been justified by grace alone, 
through faith alone. And it indicates the condition of our hearts. Do your words edify your brothers and sisters in Christ. Think about James wrote an entire chapter of the letter of James talking about the power of the spoken word. I mean, you've heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but you know that, that, that's garbage. That's garbage. You can break some bones, heal. But words, I know people to this day who are still afflicted by things that were said to them decades ago. My dad or my, my mom used to say this to me. It just cut me to the core, and that affected them for their life. The words, the things that people say, the power of the spoken words. And so do your words indicate that you are a child of God or a child of the devil. And then your deeds, obviously, James tells us in almost most of his book, that if there is no fruit being born, if there is no work being done, if there is nothing happening to indicate that you are of Christ, then what business do you have claiming to be of Christ? Is what James tells us. And so our thoughts, our words, and our deeds all indicate what is our practice. What is our practice? And so John is calling us to examine our practice. He makes it clear that, that everybody steps into the darkness on occasion. First John chapter 1, he says, if you say you have not sinned or do not sin or have no sin, then, then you're a liar. Everybody steps into the darkness on occasion. The question is, what do you do when that happens? When you step into the darkness, do you grieve the fact that you are in the darkness? Do you understand chapter 1 when John tells us that if you say you have fellowship with God, but you're in the darkness, you're lying. When you are in the darkness, when you are in sin, you cannot have fellowship with God. And so when you are having wicked thoughts, when you say wicked things, when you don't do the things that you know you should be doing, you don't have fellowship with God and you are cut off from fellowship with other believers. And that ought to grieve a believer's hearts. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 51, where David grieves his sin with Bathsheba. If you want to see what godly repentance, godly grief looks like, read Psalm 51 where, where David says, I have sinned against you and you alone, God. Forgive me, save me, restore to me the, the, the joy of my salvation. I mean, he's truly heartbroken over what he has done, that he has not walked. And this is the gravity of our sin. Think about what the Father, if you are of Christ, what the Father has done for you. And the fact that our sin grieves Him. Our sin cuts us off from fellowship with Him. Our sin keeps us from doing that which God has called us to do. It ought to grieve us, but thank God He has given us a means of restoration. And so what about us? What about others? I think... I think Christians kind of err in two ways when it comes to looking at the sin of other people. One of the ways, and I think this way applies mainly to other believers, is we ignore it. You know, we live in a very individualistic society. We live in a very isolated society. I mean, our in this town even is the most transient town in, in the history of, of reality. It lived in by, you know, our 100% or so turnover in the last couple of years. And so the idea of getting involved in somebody else's life is just not what we do. I mean, we preach at our national level. You know, you do you, I'll do me, and everybody will be good. And as long as, as, long as it's not hurting somebody, you know, it's, it's consent, you know, it's consensual, whatever, then that's fine. It doesn't matter. You, know, you do what you want to do, what makes you happy. And, and we turn the other way. We, we turn the other cheek. But consider... But consider the way that the early church viewed the sin of the church members. Now, I want to make something clear, though, right up front. You know, I, I'm not the sin police. You know, we're not, we're not the sin police. We had, Scott over this, we had a, a person in our church a number of years come to us and say, Hey, uh, this person in the church is writing things on Facebook that we think is, is mildly irreverent, uh, that they shouldn't be writing on Facebook and we said, well, uh, you know, if you're concerned, have you spoken to this person about this particular sin? 
and because we don't feel like it's our place to monitor everybody's Facebook accounts to, you know, oh, oh, that was, that was not, that was irreverent, that, that was sinful. So I'm not the sin police here, you know, we're, we're not called to, to be the sin police for other people. But really it comes to, to kind of changing the way we think about sin as far as, you know, I'm lording over top of somebody. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. And I see sin in its seriousness for what it does, for how it separates us from fellowship with God, how it separates us from fellowship with the body, how we grieve the Lord. And consider what the early church did. Paul says to the Galatians, if anyone is caught in a transgression. If you're caught in a sin, you're caught in a transgression. You're not just standing in the darkness. You didn't just step into the darkness. You're lingering in the darkness. You're remaining in the darkness. You're continuing to sin. He says, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Because the bottom line is that a true believer in the Lord Jesus, somebody who is walking in the light, could never walk content while his brother is languishing in the darkness. I can never be content to walk in the light while my brother is in the darkness. Consider what Paul says to the church of Corinth. There was a, there was a man engaged in horrible immorality in Corinth with his, with his uh, father's wife. And they were exulting in the fact that they tolerated this sin. And Paul says to them, he says, no, let him be removed. He says, you got to get this man out of the church. Get him out of the church. He says to them, he says, you got to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. He says, get this man out of the church so that Satan could destroy his flesh. That's how serious they took the sins of those in the church. But that wasn't the end state. The end state was so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. They considered it better to be destroyed in the flesh by Satan and be restored than to continue to languish in sin. And so when we see a brother who's caught in a transgression, we see a brother who is languishing in the darkness, we go to them to restore them. We're not content to allow our brothers in Christ to exist in the darkness. And this is the way we ought to deal with the sins of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I have to love my brother enough. I have to love my brother enough to know him. And that's a problem in the church. Is that we're so transient. We're so separated. We're so isolated from one another. That we don't even know. We don't even know when our brothers in Christ are struggling, our sisters in Christ are struggling. I mean, there, there could be people in this church who are struggling with all manner of stuff, and we would never even know it because we're so isolated from one another. So we've got to love our brother enough to know them. We've got to love our brother enough to get involved in their life. We've got to know our brother enough to actually care if they're languishing in the darkness. We've got to love our brother enough to actually take a risk. To step out, to, to take a risk, to risk hostility, to risk all sorts of responses that we may not expect for their sake so that they could be restored. We cannot be content to allow our brothers and sisters in Christ to walk in the darkness as we do not be content or are not content with ourselves walking in the darkness. This is the gravity of sin. What about non-believers, though? And, and this is where there's another tendency that I believe is, is uh, pretty uh, prevalent in the church, you know, whereas with those in the church, you know, we, we tend to turn a blind eye and because we, I mean, I don't want to be perceived as a busybody or, you know, a nosy person uh, or, you know, anything like that. It's not how I want to be perceived. And so that's how we treat people in the church. We do the opposite for those who are not in the church. It's really interesting if you think about how the, how the believers uh, respond to this because our tendency for those not in the church is to apply God's standards to them and point out the sin of those not in the church. Why would we do that? Isn't that an interesting thing to do? Listen to what Paul says about them in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says in their case, talking about non-believers, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I mean, they can't even see the light. 
They're in the darkness. They don't, they don't even know the light is there. They are blinded to the light. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul tells them, you, know, you hear all the time, people say, well, judge not, judge not. Well, yes, we judge. We judge in the church according to the word of God, but we don't judge those outside the church. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, they are not of Christ, so why would we expect them to behave as if they are of Christ? You know, they are not children of the God, children of God currently. So why would we expect them to behave as children of God? And so when we look at non-believers, we got to look at them in a certain way. And they are in one of two conditions, a non-believer. One condition they are is this may be a future brother or sister in Christ. This may be somebody who is yet to be reconciled with God. This is maybe somebody who is yet to be saved. Outside of that, the unregenerate are those who are bound for eternal destruction. This is the gravity of sin right here. And the Bible tells us that God is storing up wrath for them, that they are stumbling to the slaughter. Psalm 73 that we preached about says that, that God is going to sweep them away in an instant. And we can't tell the difference. We don't have any idea who is who. We don't have an idea if this is going to be a future brother in Christ or not. And so our only option, our only job, our only thing that we can do is to treat every single unbeliever as if they are a future brother in Christ. This is my brother in Christ. He is of the light. He's in the darkness, but he doesn't even know about the light. He can't see the light light because he's blinded and so my job my mission is to plead with him to beg him be reconciled to god that is my mission in life and i do everything i can i become whatever i need to become i go wherever i need to go i never change the message never does the message change but i do everything i need to do to reconcile, to help them reconcile with God. Because the bottom line, we're talking about the walk. Their problem is not that they are in the darkness, but that they are of the darkness. They are not in the darkness. They are of the darkness. And this is the gravity of sin. And I got to see this firsthand. I got to see this firsthand. Just last week, there was a, some folks that contacted us here at the church. And they said, we need you to come and pray for us. They were not believers in the Lord Jesus. And we said, that's interesting that you would contact the church. And so, so uh, some of us went by, some brothers and sisters in Christ, and spent some time with these people. And there was a woman with us, a good woman of prayer. And I watched this woman get on her knees in the face of confusion. You know, people are so confused these days. People are just insanely confused about what is true and what is false. God, the God of this world is a God of confusion. And these people were so confused about what was true. And I saw this woman holding this young girl's hands who was confused even about who she was. Begging to her to be reconciled to God. Telling her that God made you exactly who he made you to be. And he loves you. And this is how much he loved you. Be reconciled to God. This woman had compassion on this young lady. This woman had true Christ-like love for this young lady. It was evident. It spilled out. This woman was not of God at this particular point in time. But this lady went to her as if she was or would be of God. And it was overpowering. The compassion, the love that was evident there. As evident that we spent about three hours in these people's home talking to them about the Lord Jesus. They were of the Lord Jesus. But they allowed us to be in their home for three hours talking about the Lord Jesus. And it all stemmed from how this lady viewed these people. She looked at this woman and she didn't see an enemy of God. She saw she saw. The potential for restoration. The potential for reconciliation. And she loved this young lady as she was. And that would be my prayer today. And so, as we look at the words of John, what is our practice? What is your practice personally? 
What is your practice with your brothers and sisters in Christ? What is your practice with those who are not of Christ? And does it indicate that you are of Christ, that you are a child of God? John would tell us, if not, quit lying to yourself. Quit lying to yourself. Quit faking it. Call it for what it is, but be reconciled. That's what John would tell us. To get real with who you actually are. And so my prayer here today is that we would just examine ourselves. Joe's going to come and sing this sing a couple songs. And that we would use this as an opportunity to examine our thoughts, our words, and our deeds.